Hi guys, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing fantastic. It's uh, great to see all you new joiners on the channel. As always, if you haven't been part or have seen anything of my videos before, I want you to interact as much as possible. Feel free to come in, ask the questions you might have, uh, press like if you like the videos and share them with all of your friends uh, on social media. So if you like the video, then, you know, share it on your Facebook page because it really helps me to, um, to reach out to more people, to get more questions and to fill this channel with more and more content that you guys would like. So, uh, I haven't done any failure management videos for a while so I thought today is the day. Today I'll uh, do yet another one and uh, when you've seen this one, if you like it, there's going to be more failure management videos in the same playlist so feel free to look through the rest of them as well. So, what are we going to talk about today? Today we are going to talk about a pilot's worst nightmare. Okay, can you have any idea, any guess of what that might be? Well, it's not what you think normally. Um, so when I ask this to people, people normally start guessing that it must be engine failure or even engine fire or, or uh, the aircraft breaking up or something like that. But in reality, the one thing that makes the blood really, really go cold in my veins is if I hear a ding from the cabin and they call me up and they say, we have smoke or fire in the back of the cabin. Okay. Out of all the things that can happen inside of an aircraft, this this little thing here is by far my worst nightmare. Okay. Now, why is that, you might think? Well, I'm going to spend this podcast explaining that to you. I'm going to tell you what we do when we hear, when we get that dreaded report. I'm also going to tell you why it is so bad. And at the end of the podcast, I'm going to give you a story that I have, uh, because I have some personal insight into this. I have been working for about two years as an airport firefighter, so I have actually seen what fire can do in a very short amount of time. So that's what you can expect from the podcast. So stay tuned, stay tuned to the end, and I'll, sh I'll uh, I promise to give you some personal insight to it. Okay. So if we're flying along en route and the cabin crew calls us in, they normally do this uh, with a given code, which is instead of just taking up the handset that they have and press it once, which will give us a ding, a chime in the cockpit, they will press it three times. And that a sign for us, when we hear ding, 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 inside of the cockpit, we know that there is something going on in the back which is not good. But it could be anything, it could be a medical emergency, or it could be any kind of malfunction that they want us to know about. So they will then chime in and they will say, Captain, I have a PAA briefing. Are you ready to copy? Now, PAA stands for problem, action, and additional information. So we use that acronym so that I can get ready to have something to write on, so I can write it down um, in order to keep track of, of what's going on in the back. And also so that I can pass any message on to air traffic control. For example, if it's a medical emergency, I would need to know things about the person that's feeling unwell, like gender, age, previous condition, things like that. But anyway, so in this case, they would call me in and say, Captain, are you ready for a PAA briefing? I would say, yes, go ahead. And then they would say, well, the problem is that we have a fire, um, a fire in the, well, let's say, for example, the aft toilet in the bin or in one of the ovens in the back or in the front. Okay, they will give me a general location of it. Then they will proceed by telling me what actions they have taken. And uh, the cabin crew, which are really, really skilled and trained people, don't be sure of that, they know much, much more than you might think. They have given drills for every conceivable uh, situation that might arise in the back. So for example, a fire, there will be very given roles, who or which cabin crew does what, so the one who finds the fire will normally fight the fire because they are the closest one at hand and they will use whatever firefighting equipment they have close to them. The second one that comes, um, comes to the scene will be uh, the backup, which means that they are gathering with them um, firefighting equipment and getting ready to take over 
from the first one who's been fighting the fire when they are have exhausted their firefighting equipment and so on. Now, I'm not going to go too deeply into what the cabin crew is doing, that's for a different podcast. But anyway, they will be telling me, so we have a fire in the aft galley, the, these are the actions we've taken. We have uh, started the firefighting drill and uh, I am the communicator. So the, the cabin crew who's talking to me is going to be the, the, who has, the one who has the role of being a communicator, who is telling me what he or she is seeing, how it's progressing and so on. Additional information might include things like it smells like it's an electrical fire or um, the smoke is of this color, this intensity, uh, it, where it is things like that. So all of that is really important to me. Now, what do we do? Well, the first thing that any sensible pilot would do if they hear that there's a fire in the back is to, is to think, first, what's the air like that I'm breathing? So it's really important that you know any fire would produce gas, it would produce uh, toxic fumes. So it's really important that if there's anything, if we smell anything, we put our oxygen masks on immediately. Because it's really important that our heads stay clear and that we have proper oxygen to breathe so that we can quickly get down on the ground. And that brings me to my second point. So once we have established whether or not we need oxygen, um, we will start thinking about diversion. Okay? So the pilot flying will start looking for airports, any airport that's long enough, that's safe enough within range and start the diversion process. So call a pan-pan call or a mayday call, depending on what cabin crew is feeding us, what kind of information we have. Um, and they would, we would start to divert towards the closest possible airfield. While we're doing this, the pilot flying will also call for their smoke, fire, fumes, non-normal checklist from the QRH. So the pilot monitoring will take the checklist up and start going through it. And the checklist uh, is including things like trying to establish whether or not the source of the smoke or fire is known or not, uh, whether or not it's, clo it's connected to electricity, for example, so there might be circuit breakers that we need to pull. But it also tells us in the beginning of the checklist that the diversion might be needed. It's really important to remember this because, and I'll tell you later on, uh, the, the way that a, that a fire kind of progresses can be very, very quick. So that's why we initiate a diversion in any case. And then if we manage to sort things out, we can stop the diversion and we can continue on whatever we decide to do. But you have to very quickly start the process of diverting, especially if you're at high altitude, because it takes, it takes you a good you know, 20 minutes to get down normally if you're up at cruising altitude, no matter what. So quickly start diverting. The checklist keeps progressing, the pilot flying is concentrating on setting up for an approach, uh, concentrating on going into the proper airport, uh, whatever safety measures that might be uh, need to be communicated to ATC. The pilot monitoring is trying to handle the checklist, trying to sort the information, uh, sort the um, situation, and also communicating with the cabin crew to see how it's progressing in the back. So, um, it also states in the checklist that whenever smoke and fumes becomes the biggest threat, we go over to the smoke removal checklist. And that's important to remember because as in, normally when you have a fire, when you're dealing with a fire, it's not actually the fire and the flames in, in themselves that kills people. It's the smoke inhalation, the toxic fumes that, that, uh, that basically strangles people, that um, intoxicates them that keeps them from breathing and getting the oxygen they need and that's what kills people so if the cabin comes in and says listen we can hardly see anything in the back people cannot breathe properly then we start doing the smoke removal checklist uh, which includes basically well in short what it does it is that it it's opening the outflow valve in the back which sucks air out and hopefully sucks with it the uh, fumes and smoke um, now we're talking about oxygen and a lot of people ask me, so why don't you just put the passenger oxygen on to let people get the oxygen mask on? And there's a reason for that. First of all, those oxygen masks, they are there to provide oxygen in case of a depressurization of the aircraft. Which means that they are not built to stop smoke and fumes from entering the lungs. So the air that's breathed through the oxygen mask of the passengers is mixed with the air outside. So it will not help the people to breathe by breathing through the oxygen masks 
The only thing it will do is it will feed oxygen towards the fire, which is just making the situation worse. And that's why we don't put the oxygen masks down or the passenger oxygen mask down. It's different with the crew oxygen masks, the ones that we have in the cockpit, because they are sealing tight. They're built for, um, for the case of smoke and fumes in the cockpit. Okay, so that's what we're doing. So now we're trying to, um, we're, we're trying to remove the smoke to make sure that people can breathe. The cabin crew have their drills. They have moved people away from the smoke and the fire. Uh, they're telling people to keep low and they're also giving out wet tissues and things for people to breathe through in the cabin. But this is also part of their drills. Now, what we are doing after that is obviously now we're focusing on trying to get the aircraft down on the ground. Uh, at no point do we hold to make sure that we've completed the checklist. The checklist is there to help us while we're trying to get the aircraft quickly down on the ground. If the cabin crew comes in and said, listen captain, there's full panic here in the back. We do not have the uh, fire under control. We cannot control it. It, it is uh, now spreading. Then the only thing that we have left to do is to land the aircraft. And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, the only thing that we can do really is try to get the aircraft down on a field. Obviously, if we have an airport, we land on the airport. That's it. If we have a runway, even if it's a close military runway or whatever, we land the aircraft there. But if not, we have to consider an off-field landing, which is something we will never do in any other circumstance. But when it comes to smoke and fire, we know that the most important thing is to try to get the aircraft down on the ground evacuate the aircraft and let people out. Okay. Um, so that will be the absolute last uh, situation. Now, this, these things, they, I, I, I'm not trying to scare you guys, I'm just telling you what, what, what the worst case scenario is. Normally, uh, when you have smoke and stuff on board, it's something coming from the ovens, you, you get it out very quickly. So, so this is a worst case scenario. Um, no, and the, the few times that this has happened in real life, I haven't had it myself. Uh, but it's been a very nice and calm uh, diversion to an air airport somewhere. And in a few occasions, there's been a couple of, of accidents actually with this. And the flashover fire tends to happen when the aircraft get, gets down on the ground and open the doors. And the reason for that is that uh, it's then the fire that's somewhere inside then gets fed with oxygen. And that's what leads to the flashover. Uh, there is, I'm going to link to one of those. It's an, um, I think it was an Air Canada. Um, aircraft that had this happening to them. Okay. Other things with fires is that it's impossible to project what it will do. So fires can eat through insulations of cords, uh, they can eat into electrical systems, they can cripple systems of the aircraft. So and a fire can, can present itself in many, many different ways. So it's very, very hard to deal with, which is another reason that we really hate the prospect of a fire aboard. Um, so what is my experience of this then? Well, as an airport firefighter, we were drilled in dealing with these kind of situations on a daily basis. So we talked about what if, um, what if there is an aircraft coming in filled with smoke? How would we deal with this? How are we going to put the fire out? How are we going to ventilate the cabin? And, uh, and what can we expect once we get into the cabin? And in order to understand this properly, um, we got ourselves into a metal container. So a big metal container that was filled up with junk, uh, wood, plastics, things like that. And we lit a little fire. So we were in full firefighting gear. We lit a fire in one end of the um, uh, container and we waited. And what happens then is that the fire starts smoldering, just like you would imagine a fire to do. So there's a little bit of a fire in one end. Looks like a perfectly normal fire. And then the smoke, the black smoke, starts building up in the top of the cabin. And then it starts moving downwards, slowly, slowly, and always very black. The reason it's black is because it's full of burnable material. So it's, it's material that hasn't burned, it has just evaporated from whatever material is burning. And that's coming down. And eventually, it reaches the floor. And when you're sitting inside of that smoke, you cannot see anything. You can't see two centimeters in front of your face. And then at some point, as the smoke is now continuing to build up, the oxygen is coming in and the, the heat source, which is still the fire, is still left there. At some point, the mixture will be perfect for a flashover. 
And when the flashover happens, it is something that you just cannot imagine without having seen it with your own eyes. It just says, whoa! Kind of like when you, you know, if you've had a barbecue and you fed it with, with gas and it, it does not ignite and that suddenly ignites. That sound is what it makes. And then there will be flames everywhere. There is flames that is not connected to anything. When you think of flame, you think of flame connected to something that's burning. But the flashover, everything burns. As in, you can see flames coming out, out of thin air. And then it disappears. And then starch in different places and it's moving around it's beautiful but deadly and the temperature it goes from a uh, perfectly doable 30 40 degrees to you know above 500 degrees within a matter of minutes so what we had to do is we were sitting in there watching it but our firefighting gear started to crackulate so we had to get out um, and that's what's given me my um, respect for fires. This is the reason why there is a no smoking sign everywhere. This is the reason why we're so tough on people who are smoking. Okay, so remember that when you're um, when you when you hear the instruction about not smoking. Um, I hope this has been um, good for you. I hope that you've liked this video. And please press like if you do. Please share the video. And uh, I'll see you next time. Thank you.